Welcome everyone to this week's SmackDown review. No frills, no punches, just straight on reviewing, baby. No. Oh. Thank you. Oh. 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 No. Oh. No. Bailey on the mic. Sasha on the mic. Oh. Oh. Oh my God. It pretty much describes the feeling of what I had the way with SmackDown and it's open on Friday. So, so boring and so incredibly bad. Like, it almost lost me for the entire show. Thank God I was able to persevere because there was some other better stuff throughout the course of the night. But this, this was ridiculous. 30 minutes? 30 minutes? You devoted a quarter of your show to this practice? 30 dang minutes? To this hot steaming garbage? Somebody thought it was a great idea to give Bailey a live mic and actually have her emit a female Corbin promo. That's basically what it is. Then you got Lacey Evans and Dana Brooke. All the while, we're wondering the whole time how much has Dana Brooke been working on her mic work? Hey, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, Batista. Yeah, taking the chrome off his trailer hitch. But god damn. This is your first SmackDown of 2020. A first SmackDown of the decade! And you decide to kick it off with this time-killing waste of space of 30 freaking minutes! A promo, and then a pointless, boring-ass tag match! Perhaps the most exciting thing of all this was when Dana Brooke stiffed the hell out of Sasha Banks at her damn landing! But why the hell is Dana Brooke pitting Sasha Banks? I thought the focus was going to be on Lacey Evans. None of this made any sense. It's literally like you sat there and said, hey, we got half an hour to kill here. Let's throw the ladies out there, get it done and over with. And that's exactly the way the hell it came across. Whereas you could devote time to something like Otis and Mandy Rose. Like, not all love stories need to be trashy and dramatic and everything else. This is one that you can understand. This is one that you can relate to. Now look at Mandy Rose. She's a goddess. She's the creme de la creme cheerleader type. Blah, 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 blah. And here's Otis. Got a beer belly, just kind of the average, regular, underdog type of guy. And he likes her, but is she just toying with him? Is she just messing with him? Does she actually care about him? You know, this is good, sensible stuff. I'm not saying you don't need sensationalistic as well, because you do. Because it's professional wrestling. You should have something for everyone. Like, serious matches can balance out the sensationalistic trash. The sensationalistic trash can also balance out your show when you have too much buttoned-up serious wrestling. Like, balance. That's what it's all about. But what it's really all about is telling stories in easily relatable types of ways and taking somebody like Otis and putting him in a situation that actually helps him. Like, this gets some sympathy for him. This gets people more behind him because a lot of people watching, male and female, can relate to somebody like this. Like, that's, that's how you make real meaningful connections with your wrestlers and your fans. Unlike what you've done with Chad Gable. Rise over size? Rise over size! Is that what he tells the girls? Rise over size? And what's ridiculous about this is when he's talking about embracing who he is and he's Shorty G back there to the freaking revival. They're not really any damn bigger than he is! It looks stupid! Now, granted, you could say... Ever since he went to Shorty G, instead of being on, like, freaking superstars or main event show type of crap like that, he's been getting run on SmackDown pretty much every week because if Vince is aligned with the gimmick, therefore he gives a crap, that means you get something. But does that still really count? Like, long term, is that helpful to him? Are you going anywhere with this? And even if you look at it like he's supposed to be silly or stupid, it's none of that. It's just like it's lame-ass Shorty G. Much better served, in my opinion, being a heel if you're going to do this crap. 
Uh, the Dawson, wasn't it Dawson who gives a crap uh, versus Shorty G match? When I see the revival, what stands out to me so much is the importance of managers and how the lack of managers in professional wrestling has impacted the ability to create stars, which is part of the reason why WWE doesn't want him around very much anymore. You look at the revival, you look at these guys, uh, Dawson Wilder, and you say to yourself, okay, you know what? If these guys had a mouthpiece that could actually get them heat, provide them some flavor, some color, then by God, you could do big things with this tag team. But instead... They're just a team for the match move marks, and I have no interest in that. And I should, but it's because there's something missing. They just don't connect. They don't get heat. They don't elicit heat. You know, whereas opposed to Sheamus, at least, could potentially elicit some type of heat. And he's back! Bro kicked the shorty G! He's back! Those of you that are Sheamus fans, I hope you enjoyed your Celtic cum. <laughs> But Sheamus is back. Cool beans. Wasn't the only return we saw of the night. And you got the Miz versus Kofi Kingston with came out of a segment earlier on in the show where Miz was back there with Kofi and Big E. And again, simple yet effective. It's almost like somebody locked Vince in a room for a couple of these segments because they were actually well done. Like the Fiend got into Miz's mind. The fiend affected Miz. He got him where it hurts when it came to his family. And he's flipped. So now he's at, mad at Kofi, so he's going to wrestle Kofi. Like, this really, really worked. It was simple, yet effective. And not even the best part of whatever involved him is this week. But more on that in a moment. Uh, you had Otis versus Drew Gulak. Uh, not his brother. Talking about Gulag, certainly would hope not his brother at this point. Uh, but you know, Otis is one of those acts that you wonder if Tucker's going to turn on him at some point. They're probably eventually heading towards that. But here's a guy, middle of the card, you know, type of guy that'll entertain the people in a different way. And by God, we need people like him in wrestling. So I'm all down with Otis in 2020. Uh, Braun Strowman versus Cesaro. I will be completely honest, now that we're a few days later, I don't remember this match. Like I had put it in my notes, Braun Strowman versus Cesaro. I legitimately don't remember. And you could say, yeah, that was just a few days ago. But you know what? I think that's part of the problem, isn't it? Is that this match only happened three days ago. And I don't remember anything about it. That means nothing memorable happens in a lot of these matches. It's just lots of pointless filler crap. And you can't have that. You just can't have that. And then the main event tag... Because for some particular reason, we want to have <laughs> Dolph Ziggler in a dang main event. Oh, I understand. You're trying to promote Daniel Bryan and The Fiend by having the lights go and then come back and go and come back. That's fine. But why do we got to do the dog food crap again with Roman? And furthermore, we're not only doing the dog food crap, we're doing with the generic old Roy Walmart garbage. You couldn't at least spring for Perino? You couldn't spring for Pedigree? You had to go with old Roy? Oh my God! Horrible! But the big thing here about all of this, as Roman's getting attacked, here come the Usos! They come out to make the big save, and the crowd pops, and it was a good moment. Like, you had several returns on this show. This was a nice way to cap off the show. If anything else, to get us away from the stupid dog food gimmick with freaking Baron Corbin and Roman. And it's important for the Usos to come out, because by God, they need to save him. He's not only their family, he's their designated driver. But I'm going to tell you right now, all this other stuff, pales in comparison to what I thought was an okay SmackDown otherwise. It was okay. You had some good stuff. Stuff I don't remember. Stuff that was really bad. Wasting a quarter of your show on these ladies this week and the way it was done was God awful. But by God, there was one thing that wasn't on. There was one thing that made this whole two hours on Friday night more than worth it. 
Oh, let me hit it again for you. I don't even care if it's out of rhythm or not. It doesn't matter. It's about the spirit and the intent. Oh! Oh, Jolo is back! It's official! And I can't tell you how happy I am about this. And it's not so much because of me or being a fan of Jomo or anything like that whatsoever. It is just simply the fact that personally I needed this and I needed this real bad. Just imagine the sheer resplendent joy and pleasure that I got out of tweeting the video clip to Tasteless Tony D as he's traveling down the highway. Asking me, what's this? And I say, open it up. It's a big surprise. It's history in the making. And he opens it to reveal it's John Morrison. Yes! John Morrison. John Morrison. John Morrison. Yes! Yes! In your face, Tony. In your face. And his response, all he can muster, because of the magnitude and the magnificence and the awesomeness of Jomo. And his mojo was HFs that, which stands for freaking, 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 that, what he left off was the part, is incredible, is awesome. It gives me a triple T chubber down in my short pants region. So now the WWE has given me something. I can sit there every week and provide Jomo updates just for Tony. Every week, I can update Tony on what is going on with Jomo. Every week, I can build up over the course of seven days to say, hey, it's seven days till John Morrison's on SmackDown, six days till John Morrison's on SmackDown. Like, my God, I needed this. Weekly Jomo update. Weekly Jomo discussion. Weekly Jomo progress status report. I needed it in a water, and they gave it to me. And I can't wait to torture Tony's ass with this.